Greetings from the 85th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, this year's topic is biological timekeeping and the meeting is being held virtually uh, because we're, we're still dealing with the complications of the COVID virus. Yeah. But I'm Brian Ray. I'm a, a senior editor at Science Magazine published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I've had the pleasure of attending the meeting and uh, learning about a lot of uh, new work on how timing mechanisms are important in uh, maintaining physiology and health. And um, I've also gotten the privilege to um, have some conversations that are recorded with some of the speakers who presented this work um, at the symposium. And so joining me today is Ryo Kageyama, who has recently moved, I understand, from Kyoto University to uh, the Riken uh, yes. uh, um, station at Waco. Hmm. And so um, much of the work on, on biological timing has to do with this 24-hour circadian clock that, that we know quite a bit about. Um, and this is a biochemical oscillator that, that runs with a time period of 24 hours uh, and, and keeps us in tune with, with the day-night cycle of the rotation of the earth. But um, very interestingly, uh, Rio told us about a different kind of clock. These, these are independent clocks um, that, that have an oscillation, uh, a shorter oscillation, maybe two or three hours. And these turn out to be very important for this process whereby uh, a neuronal stem cell uh, differentiates into a mature uh, a cell in the brain. And so this process um, is, is very important for determining that we have the right kinds of cells in the brain, but, but it also depends on this clock mechanism to tell the cells when they should do this and, and it actually also determines what kind of cell they might become. And so I'm hoping that Rio can give us a little insight into you know, what are these different clocks and are they kind of related to, to uh, the circadian clock? Yeah, uh, thank you, Brian, for a very important question. Well, um, we work on HES1 and HES5. It's a, they are basic, basic helix helix transcription repressors. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are very similar to HES7. HES7 is a somite segmentation clock gene. And uh, um, has, both HES1, HES3, and HES7 are repressors, and they form a negative feedback. And uh, by negative feedback, these genes can autonomously start oscillatory expression. So in this sense, a negative feedback, so both circadian clock and has oscillators are controlled by negative feedback. So the basic mechanism is very similar. But uh, the most different part is a uh, circadian clock is, has a temperature compensation. So it's always 24 hour periodistic even at uh, hot or cold places. So temperature, uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, HES oscillators totally depend on temperatures. So at lower temperatures, HES clock uh, proceeds slowly. And higher temperature, HES uh, goes um, um, faster. So that's uh, one of the most important difference between circadian clock and uh, HES oscillators. And uh, another difference is um, HES oscillators have a different periodicity among species. Circadian clock, as you know, have the same periodicity among species, almost 24 hour periodicity. But HES oscillators are different from species to species. For example, it's uh, most um, precisely uh, examined in uh, segmentation clock. So HES1 and HES7 are very similar. And the segmentation clock has a two hour periodicity in mouse embryos, but it's a five hour periodicity in humans. And chicken, 90 minute periodicity. And uh, medaka is a 60 minute, and zebrafish, 30 minutes. So the periodicity is totally different. And that's the one, another uh, very different uh, point uh, between circadian clock and Hess uh, clocks. Right, so 
in a in a way that the the clocks are kind of alike that that um, transcription is turned on. There's a there's a process where the feedback comes back and then turns it off. So you had this on off cycle that, that is really kind of the oscillator, like we know happens in in other kinds of clocks. Mm -hmm. um, but but we have a separate one that that's doing this developmental timing, which is which is really really interesting. So so these these oscillations. Um, are actually important for a stem cell, which um, maintains the potential to, to differentiate, but for, for a while uh, doesn't do so, just proliferates, but then it makes a big decision that it, that it has to uh, change, make a very dramatic change in its biology to, to undergo differentiation. And so this, this has to do with, with the, the, the presence of this cycle, and, and whether these transcription factors that you're talking about are cycling or whether they're stable. And you, you told us that there's a timing mechanism that, that actually helps measure this. And can, can you describe that a bit to us? Yeah, so, yeah, thank you for another important question. So uh, neural stem cells show gene expression oscillating, but in differentiating cells, uh, the clock stops and the gene expression becomes sustained and upregulated. So um, how this transition is controlled? That's uh, our important, next important question. And uh, we initially thought that asymmetric cell division may be involved. Well, asymmetric cell division generates two daughter cells. One is um, a stem cell, the other is a differentiating cell, like a differentiating neuron. Person. And uh, we thought asymmetric cell division is a major cure for this transition from oscillatory to sustained expression. But actually we found that this transition occurs few hours before asymmetric cell division. So something already happens before that division, cell division. And we are interested in which uh, factor, which mechanism is responsible for this transition. And uh, we found uh, um, so HES oscillations drive uh, proneurogen oscillations. HES is a repressor and antagonize proneurogen. So they are by inhibiting neuronal differentiation. So, but uh, in neural stem cells, HES oscillations periodically repress proneurogen expression. So proneurogen expression is also oscillating and uh, proneurogens can upregulate many downstream genes. And uh, proneurogen oscillations lead to a, a gradual accumulation of uh, some downstream gene factors. Um, if they are very unstable, uh, proneurogen oscillation lead to an oscillatory response. But if gene products are relatively stable, proneurogen oscillation leads to a stepwise or gradual accumulation of such downstream factors. And we found one of them can repress HES1 expression. So, HES oscillations drive proneurogen oscillation. Proneurogen oscillation lead to a gradual accumulation of their downstream factors. And such downstream factors can antagonize HES oscillation and stop HES oscillation, and stop clock, HES clocks. So this is an um, important cue to start asymmetric cell division or something. So uh, we found uh, this transition is controlled by actually HES and the proneurogen oscillations. So this timing is controlled by such kind of clock. Right, so very interesting. So it's all almost like a, a counter, right? Yeah. That, yeah. That every yes, time, exactly, yes. Every yes. time the oscillator uh, yeah. goes up and down, uh, you take another step up in the right. in concentration of this factor. Yeah. And as it accumulates, then when you get to enough, then, then you tell the cell to differentiate. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. That's that's really cool. So then, uh, not only do, do these um, stem cells make this decision when they're going to go from from a stem cell to a differentiated cell, but you explained to us that that over time their capacity to differentiate the different kinds of cells changes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. this, this process is also related to these oscillations in, in these transcription factors that are controlling mm -hmm. um, stem cell differentiation. Can you explain that a bit? Yeah, so neural stem cells um, 
change their competency over time. And uh, cortex has six layers. And so layer one is the most superficial. And layer one doesn't have uh, many neurons. But layer, layers two, three, and four are so-called superficial layer. And layers five and six are so-called deep layer neurons. And uh, neural stem cells generate, initially generate deep layer neurons. And then they stop generating deep layer neurons and switch the competency and start generating superficial layer neurons. And after making superficial layer neurons, they stop uh, generating neurons and they start generating uh, astrocytes. So neural stem cells change their competency over time. And uh, we are interested in how the timing of this transition is controlled. And uh, we generated HES1 or HES5 transgenic mice, um, overexpressing HES1 or HES5 in a sustained manner, or knocking out HES1 or HES5. And what we found is that these transitions of neural stem cell competency was accelerated by HES1 or HES5 overexpression. And these transitions were delayed by HES1 or HES5 knockout. So suggesting that the proper levels of HES1 or HES5 are very important for normal timing of these transitions of neural stem cell competency. By accelerating the transitions, um, deep layer neurogenesis uh, period is very short. So small, only a small number of deep layer neurons are formed, something like that. And uh, also uh, astrocytes are increased because astrogenesis uh, occurs prematurely by uh, accelerated transitions. And conversely, uh, when uh, these transitions are delayed, then uh, deep layer neurons are increased in number. And as a result, astrocytes are decreased in number. So the proper cell composition critically depends on the normal timing of the, these transitions. And the HES oscillations seems to be involved in these uh, transitions. So that's what we found. That's impressive. Yeah. So the, these, these clocks and, and these timing mechanisms are, are really part of um, this very complicated process of development uh, mm -hmm. where um, cells need to know when to do the right thing and to do the right thing in, in a population of cells so that you build something as, as complex as the brain. And mm -hmm. it, it's just fascinating to see um, the understanding on a molecular level of, of the oscillations of these particular genes and the way they, they contribute to, to this process. Mm -hmm. uh, really um, very beautiful work. Well, thank you, Rio, for, for, um, for taking the time to, to be with us. <laughs> you know, it's very late in Japan. It's early in, <laughs> in California. Um, but I enjoyed speaking with you and yeah, uh, we thank appreciate you. Yeah. you. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, talking with you. Yeah. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Thank you. And thanks to Cold Spring Harbor as well. Yeah. Thank you very much.